I'm very pleased to be with you all again. Um, I've done a number of these webinars now and uh, personally and, and as a company we really appreciate EAA's efforts to put these on. And uh, we hope that uh, like I did uh, in putting this, this together, I uh, hope it's an educational experience for everyone and uh, hopefully can be used to build on and, and uh, by the way, Tim and I are both very interested in, in what other topics as we roll through this fairly extensive presentation <laughs> covering a lot of territory, what areas you're interested in learning more on and uh, we'll be very happy to tailor some future presentations to your interest. But uh, as you can see from the title, we're talking about modern flight tools uh, to record, uh, measure and confirm Sonic's flight performance and as you'll find out from this presentation, we're not just talking about flight performance, we're going to be talking about uh, also data recording in general for some of the ground running and things that we do. Um, first I want to talk about the value of the Sonics Flight Performance Standard. As, as you all know, the experimental amateur built world it could be described as the wild, wild west of aviation where there really are no rules uh, except for these great freedoms that our government has allowed us and that's what that big experimental is on the side of our aircraft which we proudly display. But it gives you an opportunity to uh, try different things, uh, to do these different experiments and, and, and build as a community the, the knowledge uh, as we grow and uh, find out what works and what doesn't. Best way to try it. You know, <laughs> calculations can only take you so far. But what we bring to the table as a company, as one of uh, a number of reputable companies uh, in this industry, is not, uh, not only do we have a baseline of 10 flying prototypes, uh, and as you'll find out later in the T-Flight program, you can actually come fly them, uh, but we also have standard propellers. And the best way, people that, that aren't familiar with propeller design and matching to airframes and to engines, you know, I think of a, a a particular propeller is kind of like putting a, a gear. If you're in a manual transmission car, it's like uh, setting it at first gear and just going to drive. And um, you know, we try to, to aim for kind of the mid middle ground, something that'll give us good climb performance, good cruise performance. And that's what we've done with the standard propellers from our partners at Sensenic. Um, here is a, a good example. This is just a small sampling, this picture of uh, what's on the wall in our R&D center just some of the propellers that we've tested uh, in the past and I personally have flown I mean it's got to be approaching 50 propellers if not more on the various prototype aircraft but we have uh, the 3300 Jabru propellers here at the top uh, we've got a, another 2200 propeller a Jabru propeller here and then you see the ones turning the opposite direction are the uh, the Volkswagen powered because it does turn the other direction so even just looking at the props, you kind of know what they are. And over here are the standards that we've developed. So we've, we've again, done all this flight testing for you as part of our experimenting process. And you can take advantage by buying one of these standard props that are CNC machined. And we know right away uh, some of the performance measures that you should expect. And it helps our tech team in troubleshooting this to, to try to understand uh, if something is wrong with the engine, if it's not putting out power. Uh, something different is going on with your airframe, preventing it from climbing properly or the propeller turning up. So here's what we're talking about on uh, just one number or one series of numbers here that I'd like you to take away from this presentation, especially if you're a current Sonics pilot or you're considering purchasing a Sonics or, or anything in the family. Uh, this is what you should expect uh, as we go down with an Aero V engine, which is in black on any of our Sonics YX or 1X. Uh, for wide open static RPM for an Aero V powered uh, airplane, you should see 3100 to 3200. When we say static, that's tying the, the thing down and, and doing a, uh, a full static run up. Don't recommend doing that extensively because it's not good for cooling the engine. But uh, what it gives you is first order right away with one of these standard props what you should expect your engine to do. Climb RPM 3000 to 3150. Climbing tends to load the propeller. So the RPM doesn't, doesn't turn up as much. The engine doesn't turn up as much. When you level out at wide open throttle, we expect between 32 and 3400 RPM. That's what these direct drive engines are designed to do uh, to give you the full horsepower rating. They've got to turn up. And the 3300 Jabru powered airplanes, which is you know 50% more power, 120 horsepower, 
uh, with the uh, 54SK62 or 64G. The difference between these on the left hand side, that is the 54 diameter SK blade with a 62 pitch and this is a 54 diameter SK blade with a uh, glass, 64 inch pitch glass uh, blade, meaning a wood core composite coated prop. Like putting a bulletproof vest on, you, on your prop. And same thing up here with the Aero V. JV5L is the blade, 54 is the diameter, 44 is the pitch. All different Propeller manufacturers use different numbers. Obviously, the diameter is a standard, although we even find variability there with some of the hand carved props. But the the pitch is uh, is you might have a 44 pitch with a different blade, and it's measured differently, so it has wildly different RPM numbers. But I left this slide up for a while because I want you to to jot these numbers down again, especially if you're a current pilot or you're about to fly and you want to know what to expect or what a what a healthy quote unquote healthy engine should be putting out with these props. And if you don't have a Sensenic prop, uh, then um, these numbers might not mean much, but you sure should be aiming for these, uh, especially at the wide op open throttle uh, to, to measure full performance. So th this slide might look familiar to many of you if you've tuned in to my previous webinar, which I'll refer back to a number of times in this, on the weight and balance and the reality check. I'm talking about what our prototypes actually weigh. But I've, I've, I've told the story a different way looking inside the cockpit. So this time we're starting to look at the instrumentation as we have them equipped. Um, and right now this is SX-1, our number one prototype, which has an early 3300 Jabru and this, that standard Sonic Sensenic prop I talked about. The panel has a true track uh, three act, excuse me, it does not have an autopilot. This is a cut and paste error, but it does have an MGL Horizon XL and it does have the Garmin 196 mount. That 196 GPS is more than obsolete. Uh, we, we've had them for years and we just continue to use them because they work. We also have a little microwear panel monitor radio and there's the empty weights. I chose two different pictures. This one on the left was the second iteration of panel. This particular airplane, I think, has had, uh, Dad and I were talking about it the other day, I think it's had five different instrument panels in it. Um, the first one was all analog gauges, so all these little round two and a quarter gauges. And eventually we got frustrated with, with a tachometer that wasn't accurate, so we purchased this first engine information system, this EIS from Grand Rapids. And we've been buying items from them for many, many years. They've been very good partners and put out an excellent product, in my opinion. Um, and this was just for the engine data and no data recording at that point in time although he did I believe they had some serial outputs so you could go to a laptop but we just never uh, took advantage of that but we ended up just using it to display engine info and then here was our flight info like a airspeed altimeter VSI manifold pressure now with the modern and you'll see this trend as I continue through these slides we, we rely on these single digital gauges so this is that uh, MGL Horizon XL an early version black and white with the yellow buttons I don't think they even sell it anymore it is now uh, obsolete but here is a, a modern MGL instrument this is in prototype number three uh, 112 Sierra X-ray an airplane I have just a ton of flight time in uh, Aero V powered um, as it's equipped down here in the corner, we have the MGL uh, Enigma, which has a built-in GPS, and this happens to be the GPS antenna sitting in a nice spot right on top of the glare shield. Uh, it's got an MGL V10 radio, and uh, this Enigma does have data recording capabilities, so this is a little SD uh, uh, card slot, so it's a memory card, and it will actually data record as we go, and I put it down here, data recording with this MGL Enigma. So I have a lot of flight data. Uh, not just from the hand notes that I made early with the clipboard and jotting things down and recording them, but now the modern series we have a lot of uh, flight data on the airplane. The YX prototype, this is another one. The first YX has had a number of different instrument panels in it. This is the latest version. Took it took all these pictures this week. Um, in 2013 we've got the True Track, that is correct, three axis autopilot, that's right here. We have uh, the Garmin 196 SD card in it. So that's fully data recording. Flew this and originally installed this with the Turbo Aero V and got a, a lot of data off of that and uh, now using it uh, in our T flight. And I'll go through some of that in a little bit. The Xenos uh, prototype number one has that same um, early MGL Ultra Horizon XL 
no data recording capable, uh, nor is this GPS. Uh, it does have a little uh, Tasman Total Energy for you glider guys out there. That might be an interesting device for you to have in the microwave radio. And then the G-meter is simply a, a spring-driven G-meter to go up and down. No data recording. Awesome airplane, though. Uh, Xenos prototype number two. Uh, this picture was taken this summer, and it shows the Stratomaster Horizon XL, a little newer version. It's got the rounded corners, a little different display, and uh, Pete upgraded his uh, his Xenos with this. Um, it's got uh, the Tasman Total Energy right there, the micro radio, and a Garmin GPS, along with an actual uh, analog G meter. This is a GoPro camera. So before, if we didn't want a clipboard and you didn't have uh, uh, an instrument uh, capable of, of data recording, this is another way you can gather data these days is to stick a high-definition uh, movie camera with a mount that looks at the instrument and records various data. And I'll be going through that here in a little bit, why we did that. Sonics prototype number four is a tr another Tri-Gear, kind of the sister to the uh, uh, prototype number three. Uh, and it uh, is another Sport Trainer 2.1. Doesn't have data recording. It has these smart singles. So this is giving you some ideas of how you can lay out your panel. Even in our factory aircraft, we've we've done some variation with the center mount controls for both pilot and passenger, or pi passenger and pilot to reach it. We also have uh, have uh, been testing this uh, this autopilot from Trio, which helps with data recording that I'll be covering here in a little bit. It goes ahead and flies your heading maintains altitude, really nice devices to have on board if you're doing R&D like we are. And then, again, a, a, a microwave radio and these smart singles. It's hard to beat the price of these MGL smart singles. While they don't data record, uh, they do um, certainly give you what you need to fly the airplane at a very affordable price. Uh, Sonics prototype number five is a Sport Acro. You may have heard of this. It's got the longer ailerons on it. So this is kind of our, our, our competition aerobatic, if you will, airplane, if we were to do that. It's got a center stick. So for uh, you larger guys, if you want the biggest single-seat airplane in the world, here you go. Uh, you can put the center stick in and use the outside rudder pedals. And, man, I've seen some really, really big people uh, fit in this airplane quite comfortably. Another interesting note, so this has the smart singles. Uh, it's got a little handheld radio, so we were even too cheap to put a panel mounted radio in there. We're practical people. Uh, and it's got the mechanical uh, G-meter uh, um, 196 mount up here. And then this is, is just a piece of Velcro. And I'll be talking about that a little later, but this is for your smartphone. So this is for the iPhone or your Android device to, to use for data recording uh, if you don't want to bring the clipboard along. Definitely great apps to be able to do so. 1X number one, uh, please refer back to the previous webinars if you want to learn more about this airplane, but I have it equipped with the uh, MGL Also Extreme here, which has a little data card. This is the, uh, mic uh, excuse me, the MGL radio and a little MGL G meter. This is a smoke tank down here on the floor, so no, that is not gas, that's just for fun. Uh, put some stuff and a little pump in there to pump to the exhaust and, and make some smoke for flybys and things. Uh, but that's uh, you know that's why the panel size here is not huge. It's meant for these new generation of instruments that we knew were coming years ago. And here's the one X prototype number two, almost identical to one X prototype number one. Just again has a handheld radio, a little more cost-effective solution for us. Uh, an MGL Extreme with the data card, and uh, then the rest of the, the cockpit layout here for you. The YX Electric, so one of the most advanced electric aircraft in the world, lives right here at Sonics in Oshkosh. Uh, as it's equipped today, a really, really simple panel uh, with, with the, one of the most advanced electronic uh, uh, boards, controllers, right ahead of it. But it's got the 54-kilowatt uh, electric motor with a standard Sensenic prop, and we'll talk about that in the data acquisition uh, that our partners did out in California. It's got uh, the E-Flight custom display. So this was custom built by our team, uh, by Andrew Pierce and Pete Buck and, and John and myself. In uh, pretty simple, just has a key switch. So turn it on, turn it off. Got an instrument master. And again, this is a whole nother webinar to go through the features of this. 
but uh, that's uh, that does not have data recording. But if we were to to design a, a next generation of this, certainly it would be a, a standard feature. And then over here is just a flight uh, smart single. So this would give our airspeed altimeter all the stuff you need to fly the airplane. And uh, that's how you can fly these days. It's for simple people like us. Subsonics, prototype number one. Can you cram any more in that panel? But uh, this is an amazing amount of electronics in a very small package. And with the next generation subsonics, the subsonics 2, there's a bit more panel space to play with. Uh, but again, we anticipated uh, these uh, these devices would be coming. Uh, it's equipped with a Flight 2 uh, smart single. So that's what uh, this guy is right here. Um, it's equipped with the uh, MGL uh, V10 radio. Uh, and uh, the hour meter is right here. And a mechanical uh, fuel pressure gauge. And uh, then we also have that our friend the Velcro right here. So we're talking about some of the smartphone data that we compiled with this, uh, with this airplane. And this is actually uh, on the left hand side of the panel is a controller for the uh, PBS uh, engine. So that was supplied with the PBS along with the, uh, with the throttle. So we just installed that. Um, next up, uh, this is just kind of a visual for where we are today. Old flight data recording technology would be what what's flying in all the uh, airliners. It's solid. It's proven. Extremely expensive, um, but it is it is really built for one thing, and that's to uh, survive the crash so they can figure out what happened. Um, and that same kind of uh, uh, works surprisingly mechanically these days. But uh, that's the old technology uh, still used. Over here is what we can now buy for our experimental aircraft with uh, a lot of the same capability as the little black box, the actual orange box. But um, there's a 4 gig SD card you can stick in there and uh, record you know, a number of hours of data and then uh, have fun pouring over it and analyzing it. This is not a screenshot from our airplanes, by the way. I just pulled this off of the uh, MGL website. But it gives you an idea of the package size and the color and, and how far we've come in a few years. We're, we're almost eclipse the commercial fleet with what we can do these days uh, uh, because of the, the rigorous uh, uh, licensing that they have to go through to get new technologies on certified aircraft. Um, the published uh, company performance Personics prototypes is taken directly from our flight test numbers. Um, now that we have enough of a fleet out there, it's pretty much a uh, fact that our, that our customers have confirmed all the flight performance for themselves. Again, as long as you're getting that, that real key in for part of it and getting uh, the right RPM to turn on, on your standard propellers. But on here, this is the full specs are listed on our website, sonicsaircraft.com. Well, what I've done here is culled the, the, uh, the, the specs down to what we actually recorded with flight data. So the stuff we're actually looking to record and confirm are things like stall speed, very important for sport pilot compliance and for a safe flying airplane, uh, the clean stall 46. And then you go down the other performance with the 80 horsepower AeroV of uh, cruise speed at sea level, cruise speed at 8,000 feet, takeoff distance, landing distance. And then you see the 80 uh, horsepower Jabiru and then the 120. Takeoff distance goes down, but landing distance stays the same. Uh, utility categories would just be a heavier Sonics. So this is a two-person Sonics is rated utility category. Um, and then we have the aerobatic category uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the 80 horsepower uh, Aero V, Jabru, and 120 listed. Here are the, for the YX, basically the same numbers. So this is pulled out, called out, and, and, uh, and listed here for the various uh, uh, loadings. Here it is for the Xenos. So for the Xenos, we have a bit of a simpler menu with just the Aero V and the 120 uh, Jabru offered. But uh, those are from actual flight data. Published company performance uh, for the 1X, uh, even easier, because you only have the 80 horsepower uh, uh, Aero V offered. So list of cruise speed, uh, uh, sea level, 8,000 feet, takeoff landing, and, and rate of climb for aerobatic category. So those will become talking points as I move through this test or through this presentation. Now we'll talk a little bit about calibration. And uh, it, we, we use the term around here quite a bit, and I know you've heard it a lot, uh, junk in, junk out. 
uh, data recording only has its value when you actually take the time to confirm that what you are recording is accurate. So this is one suggestion. Uh, this is our friend here on the field, Bruce Botterman, who has a, a, a repair center here. Does a number of different things, but this is a certified pedo static test set uh, from Barfield. And he brought it over, and this is the 1X under the 1X wing, and hooked it up to the pedo uh, static line and actually was able to uh, uh, supply a known airspeed pressure uh, and calibrate it. And so we were able to confirm that, our, that our, uh, we weren't getting junk in, that what we were actually seeing on our MGL instrument in terms of airspeed uh, was accurate. And I, I recommend doing this. It wasn't cheap, but uh, definitely worth it uh, for the kind of testing we do and using it for commerce. Uh, airspeed calibration in the 1X, another uh, uh, experiment, if you will, was we weren't necessarily convinced with the 1X we have the split of the wing and the wing fold is is only a few feet outboard of the fuselage. So I wanted to confirm that the vein we have, the pedostatic vein under the wing, was giving us an accurate reading. So this test is a funnel with a long run of plastic tubing uh, running right from the instrument all the way out and, and we actually put a switch valve on the panel and we in doing this testing we actually switched from between the pedostatic vein uh, underneath the wing shown on the plans and standard in both of our prototypes and we're able in real time to switch over to this uh, funnel that was being dragged behind the airplane and here it is being uh, untaped from the fuselage unfurled by dad and here's Drew flying it and uh, brought it all the way out and there he is a few hundred feet behind the airplane. So that's that switch. So we were able uh, to do a confirmation again of the data uh, being recorded on the MGL instrument. So here's a good uh, sample of uh, data. I just took a little piece of the spreadsheet, cut and pasted it here. And I know it's kind of hard to read, but I'll step you through it here. So in we, we labeled then at, at points in video time, so I had a video camera running as well, showing when we reached up and switched from one to the other. So in this easterly direction, you know, on this particular time flying at about 4,000 feet um, at 140 miles an hour-ish, 148 true, we were able to switch from that normal, and then this is recording every second. So <laughs> twice in a minute was able to switch and get a real-time recording of what that impact was and be able to kind of calibrate, if you will, our, our installation. And here's a few more data sets that I pulled from these spreadsheets at points of the switching. Points of the switching, points of the switching. Different airspeeds, different point in time. And what we discovered is the normal port location under the wing actually reads two to four miles an hour faster than the actual airspeed uh, using that funnel being dragged. And uh, so it was basically overstating speed at the end of the day in, a, in its reading. Very valuable info to know. So now I wanted to switch gears uh, to a very, common, um, a very common thing that some builders do, which is to leave off the wheel pants and the gear fairings. And I always like to make special emphasis, especially when I hear now that, you know, oh, a Sonics is going 10 to 12 miles an hour slower than your published specs. Well, the first question I'm going to ask is what propeller are they flying? The second question I'm going to ask is with that propeller, what is the RPM? And the third question I'm going to ask is are they flying with wheel pants and gear fairings? So I did a, a simple test. This was it, before the days of having the data recording instruments. And on the left-hand side, you can see our, uh, our Flight uh, 2 uh, instrument, which has the altimeter, airspeed, uh, the VSI, the voltage, all that. And on the right side, this is our engine data. So this is our engine RPM, EGT, CHTs, oil temp, oil pressure. And at this point in time, for this flight test, I took the, uh, on the exact same day, I took the Tri-Gear Sonics up with uh, all these things on and did a web posting on this a number of years ago with the, with the conclusion. So some of you are not held in suspense right now. <laughs> But there's the airspeed listed at this, so 2,400 feet, I was cruising at 121 miles per hour uh, airspeed. And right there is true, 126. So for Tri-Gear Sonics, not too shabby uh, at that lower altitude and lower RPM, 3140 RPM. 
Then I did exactly the same test without the uh, main wheel pants. So the gear fairings are still there. I just pulled the wheel pants off on the exact same day, same basic condition. So there's the altimeter, just under 3,000 feet. Uh, 111 miles an hour, hmm. indicated airspeed. Interesting. <clears throat> Here we took the gear fairings off, and I went up and made uh, exactly the same flight, or close to it, 2,600 feet, uh, turning 3080 RPM, a little, little bit lower, not too much, uh, 105 miles per hour. Holy cow! Huge impact in in uh, drag. I, I think. Uh, the percentage is, is very large. So I'm going to spend some time. This is the data from those flights. And I actually compiled the data in three different ways. Uh, now this makes my, my uh, head spin because I'm like, man, it would be easy with that MGL Extreme to just pull the data sets off and analyze them, which is what I've been doing as of late. But here's the data that I manually recorded uh, down this left column with flight direction, RPM, altitude, the air speeds, three different air speeds, indicated true and GPS speed. Uh, our VSI are charging two EGTs, two CHTs. The only reason I only recorded these two is that's what the capability of the smart singles are, four aux inputs, so two EGTs and two CHTs. We tend to take the two uh, back EGTs and the two front CHTs or vice versa. So I'm monitoring one of each cylinder. Oil temp and pressure. And then I color coded this, and I know these numbers are kind of small. So again, I'll interpret across the top here. I have flight direction, RPM, altitude, indicator airspeed, true airspeed, GPS speed, VSI charging, EGT, CHT, oil temp, oil pressure. And I have them color coded for the white ones being recorded manually with a clipboard and a pen. The green I actually recorded from an image I took with my uh, cell phone. And the, the yellow was taken from a movie camera that I had mounted. So uh, I kind of compiled all that data together and came with an average conclusion. And you're going to hear me say average a number of times. Averages are critically important when we responsibly uh, 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 report data. But what I really care about is this, uh, this airspeed number. So here in, in uh, the GPS speed going the same direction with a, here with a, th with a average of our speeds of 126 miles per hour. Here are the GPS speeds of 122.5 with no wheel pants. And here the flight with no wheel pants and no gear fairings, I'm down to 113.5. Whoa. Then I always keep little notes. I take my handwritten notes and turn them into uh, spreadsheets and then record them. Those of you that know me, it's not shocking at all that I would make this a spreadsheet. So flying without main wheel pants and gear fairings on a tri-gear airplane, uh, flying without just the wheel pants is 3 miles an hour. Flying without the wheel pants and without gear fairings is 10 miles an hour. So it is significant, and I urge you all, if you're looking for a one magic bullet for increasing the performance of your airplane, put gear fairings and wheel pants on it. Data recording with uh, MGL instruments. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on these next two slides because I think this is the real core of, uh, of the presentation. This uh, MGL Extreme uh, has the ability of basically acting like a black box. And it, uh, it uh, records directly to this SD card uh, that inserts in this slot. And it even tells you when it's recording because the little flight timer actually blinks little flight timer blink saying, yes, I am recording. I'm happy. Uh, it can export in a KML, which is uh, that Google Earth language. I'll show you a couple of those outputs here in a minute. A CSV, which is basically a spreadsheet format that you can then export into like Excel and work with it. And uh, even has an FAA gliding commission, for, so an IGC formatted file that you can just upload, and then they'll, they'll uh, report it. But I'll make it records uh, the following flight data. So all the stuff we care about, date and time, altitude, barometric pressure, airspeed, true airspeed, VSI, glide climb, volts, OAT. Other fields, like you can customize it. So that's kind of cool, uh, engage or disengage it. And here's what an output looks like. And again, I know this is, this is kind of fuzzy. Wait till we get to some future <laughs> slides here with the spreadsheets and the volume of data. But this is uh, from a T-Flight. Uh, that was done last week. And uh, this was a fairly heavily loaded YX. 
and uh, the climb out here, if we averaged, I kind of color coded this. So I took across the top is that same data that we just went through that's exported to a spreadsheet. And then we can take it and we can average it down these columns. And that's what you're seeing here. So the vertical speed 423, it got, and you'll see a, a, a graphing here, it got as high as 600 feet per minute. RPM of uh, 3082. EGT of 1033, CHT of 306. These are the famous Wisconsin AeroVs that are actually tuned properly and run in the green all the time. And we encourage you all to do the same. Oil temp and pressure 169 degrees F for the temp and 50 in the pressure. That's right where we want to be with these engines. Um, here's another way and a very good way, in my opinion, to view the data unlike uh, the spreadsheet, which is just a row of numbers. And at any given time, we can grab one of these um, points in time. It's recording every second, by the way. So this is, this is uh, not even a, a, a half a minute's worth of data. <laughs> it's all happening very, very quickly. But you can also, you'll be able to see how this jumps around. So back to that word average and why. Uh, but uh, instead of looking at a bunch of numbers and trying to pick one in time and not realizing or recognize the accuracy of it, we can do things like this. We can plot uh, from that spreadsheet uh, like the feet per minute and the altitude. So this light blue line represents the altitude. So we're climbing up from, you know, starting altitude at Whitman is 800 feet. So this is right from when their wheels left the ground all the way to, I stopped this graph at, a, at just over 2,000 feet. And then um, you'll see this is the VSI down here. And, and the, the feet per minute, the vertical speed, is jumping all over the place at, at, at any given second because the airplane's flying through the air. And, you know, bumpier day, they'll bump even more. But uh, we can, uh, and then this is just time marching forward here on the X. And here is uh, when, when we just start to call this data out, the time kind of overlaps. It gives a date code and a time code. But again, each data point is one second on that spreadsheet. And here is uh, the true airspeed uh, and the altitude. So here we leveled off. I wanted to confirm it. So this would represent a level off at 2,000 feet of altitude. And here is what the uh, true airspeed had leveled off on. So I'm looking at this data set going, this is a pretty consistent data set. I can really take those numbers and average them out. So now I, I'm satisfied that we were in a leveled condition. Um, and it was plotted versus time. Uh, a consistent heading of 274 degrees. So that's the other cool part about these data exports. It actually gives you heading data. So you know if uh, you know you see that wild swing through the seconds of the degrees of your heading, you know you're in a turn. That's not going to be good data for reporting uh, things like uh, uh, air speeds. So I'm satisfied that's a good data set. So now I can blow it up a little more and take the date and time and just look at the true airspeed. Uh, the true airspeed in this case with this uh, this T flight that they did at only 2,000 feet and 3,100 RPM. Uh, so that's throttled back quite a bit for, for a, a straight and level. They were, they were doing 130 miles an hour. Awesome. Awesome. A nice, easy cruise in a YX at Gross. And here, this is a fun thing you can do. Uh, this is, again, the same T-Flight uh, exported to a Google Earth. So that's the KML file I talked about. And I've had a lot of fun with these. And really, they're critically important. In my, in my opinion, for uh, getting a handle on, on what I was doing uh, on a particular flight. Or, you know, Jeremy isn't flying all these missions. Um, so this is the Google Earth uh, KML export. And again, where, where I uh, started to break up a little bit, I was talking about the value of these uh, flight paths and how, especially if I'm looking for a straight and level segment, I can actually turn this into a visual cue. So I know... On this particular flight, there was a climb to altitude and then just a straight shot, straight west. And that's what's nice about Oshkosh, all these straight blocks uh, of uh, one, mile, uh, acre, or one mile blocks. So I know that'd be a great way to look at some good, solid airspeed data. And uh, what we publish is actually at 8,000 feet. So in this case, I can just look at the bars and tell you they didn't climb to 8,000 feet, uh, just a couple thousand feet above uh, ground level. 
And here's another data export for the 1x. So this is again a the tip of the iceberg really for the amount of data that we have collected. And I am just one man and uh, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm in charge of a lot of data here at Sonix and uh, if I had my druthers I would be spending a lot of time analyzing this data and reporting it but the reality is I have a company to run and new products to build and lots of other things to do as you'll hear a little later in the presentation so uh, but it, the good news is I am saving it and for future analysis it'll, it'll be there and especially when we talk about comparing to a baseline and uh, and and changing changing things through the years as we are known to do through our research we're able to, to have that baseline and know exactly what impact a different propeller made or a certain speed mod made or you know whatever possibilities are endless but here's a data export from uh, May 2nd so it's a fairly cold day outside air temperatures recorded so it was like uh, 30 degrees or something like that F and here's some climb out data at 800 <coughs> excuse me at 800 pounds I'm climbing out at 668 feet per minute at 3100 rpm EGTs of 1138 CHTs of 309 oil temp uh, 192 and pressure 52 so that's pretty healthy and this is uh, again um, part of an R&D uh, process so I'm not pushing it too hard this is the fun uh, Google flight path and the reason I outported this one I actually uh, uh, wanted to show that not only am I doing this pattern work but I'm climbing up to altitude and I'm doing these triangle paths and the idea of these triangle paths is another averaging technique to take the wind component out and be able to properly report, report a true airspeed um, and that uh, that's very important so you can see I did two basic triangular circuits I've got flights where I've done you know 10 or 20 and again the data we use for, for actual reporting on our website is at 8,000 feet this is more of a fun flight that I was filming at the time um, so here's another plot true airspeed in light blue versus time and uh, this was a heading of 93 degrees uh, at 4,000 feet and 3550 RPM so I'm a little really letting her rip on this run and you can see I as time advances I'm able to, to get this red line this trend line right at about 150 miles an hour <clears throat> at only 4,000 feet and then uh, here's the data export for 1x number 2 uh, this is the tri-gear 1x so I've done very similar report uh, flights for that a few days later and here's what that flight path looked like just doing pattern work which uh, you know I'm still able to get some good data even on these down with legs good descent rates and good climb rates and I wanted to note I've done a, a series of high definition ground tours and flight tours and uh, for those interested in really learning more uh, particularly about flying the airplane and if you're not able to make it for the T-Flight program I will be publishing those shortly again as I get some time uh, and get them edited uh, to get them out there uh, I'm excited to have you come flying with me switching gears quickly to the Aero V uh, turbo test cell a lot of interest in this Aero V turbo and why I feel it has relevance to this presentation is this MGL instrument right here and what we have here is the turbo set up in a little test cell in the back of our R&D center and this shield is to, to to, to, to get cooling air down through the turbo and uh, try to try to keep it cool so we can do full power runs and this has data recording this is what's called their EMS it's their engine uh, uh, version of the extreme and I have been logging a lot of data uh, this is just a note again to those interested in the turbo I, I promise I will get an update out soon um, again it's just been very hectic around here but I continue to work on this it's been one of my primary projects and I actually have quite a bit of help on it as well but uh, we know more power is good and there's what the configuration looks like uh, in the test cell <clears throat> and here's what some of the data export looks like so this is just taken a week or week or two ago uh, in some of the runs I did this that week uh, you can even see the seven gallons per hour right there but a, a lot less data so uh, this is actually almost readable given uh, it's just recording time and voltage and uh, gallons per hour 
and um, oil temp, oil pressure, four EGTs, four CHTs, because it has a bigger RDAC and has the capability of that. That's what these green bars are down here with an RPM and a manifold pressure. And here's a summary um, of uh, some of the some of the testing we've been doing. You know, about 7.7 7 gallons an hour at 2935. That is not a standard aero V prop. That's a much larger prop, of four or five more inches of pitch and uh, gives you some of the EGTs really able. I was, I was just pleasantly surprised at how stable the temperatures are uh, with the turbo. It's kind of cool. So switching gears again <clears throat> to another way to collect uh, data, and this is what I referred to earlier with the Xenos. Been a lot of interest in our electric project, and yes, we continue to work on it. We continue to spend time and resources on it uh, as we can and hoping obviously battery technology takes a huge leap forward before it uh, it continues to just marginally improve. But uh, this is a very visual concept of what uh, the duration, the flight duration looks like with current battery technology and then hopefully some, some time frames where we can just have the same battery weight for more flight time. But this is a kind of a total energy experiment and, and, and data analysis. Um, and this is a GoPro camera pointed at the MGL uh, um, uh, flight horizon. And obviously, if we had an MGL Extreme, we just have a data card. But it flew the Xenos. This is what the the data, the the screen looked like from the GoPro camera, and you're able to take at increments, seconds, couple per uh, every two seconds. Here you can see recording things like RPM, altitude, airspeed, vertical speed, and altimeter, and build that data manually. So this is the way that we used to have to do it, and have to do it if you have the instruments that aren't data recording. And the, the concept here was to build a flight profile of what kind of uh, energy it would take, or power it would take in kilowatt hours to fly a kind of standard day VFR fun mission. So a lot of what we do, uh, as we have a half hour, an hour here and there to go go do some fun flying, and you can see uh, it ha the flight phases of climb. So here is time again on this axis, and here is the climb up to altitude, do some fun aerobatics uh, at altitude, then come on down, do a few touch and goes, and taxi home. And uh, there's a known shaft horsepower to RPM correlation. So we're able to actually take an RPM data point and translate it. Uh, this is through calculations and flight tests. We're able to get this, uh, this horsepower rating, and be able to turn that into over this mission how much shaft horsepower is required over this time period, and then add up uh, kind of those those integrals. And we ended up uh, assuming a 1,050 pound airplane with about 85% prop efficiency. And about an eight-minute uh, discrepancy caused by lower climb rate and slower speeds due to sinking air. And take, again, that power and uh, derive it over time. And uh, it was kind of cool to build that profile and get a handle on just how much uh, energy density, energy power, would, would be to do this simple mission. And uh, that's that's uh, what we came up with, with uh, with. Uh, um, not the largest battery pack in the world, but something you can still go have some fun with. Now switching gears again. There's a lot cooking here at Sonics. What can I say? Um, Subsonics flights. So these were conducted by my father and a gentleman uh, by the name of Bob Carlton, who many of you may know uh, from uh, the uh, air shows in his Super Salto, the jet-powered glider. And Bob has an upcoming flight article on the subsonics coming up uh, in Sport Aviation shortly. So it's been uh, sent to the editor and hopefully will be published soon. We're thinking winter. And uh, a lot of what I'm about to talk about will be captured in there. So this might be more exciting for those of you that do have a legacy instrument or old uh, steam gauges and you prefer flying with them, but you still want to do some data recording. Uh, one option is is a piece of free software called XC Soar, and this is that uh, this is an Android device. Obviously, it, I do believe they have an iPhone version as well. But it's um, the raw data can be compiled to build uh, um, a, a nice flight profile, 
And these are some of the, this is some of the data that Bob, and I know again this is very small, but this is kind of a raw data export for each of these event durations of flights. And he names the data once he's flown, names the flight path with that, uh, with that same title, so we're able to go find it and analyze it. And then we're able to, to record and compile a lot of data with the jet. But the things, again, you'd think we'd care about. What are the total flight hours of the program? The percent of RPM uh, flown in a particular flight? Uh, how many uh, in a particular flight phase? How many gallons per hour, which would be the MGL Flight 2 export? The gallons and uh, miles per hour from XC SOAR, miles flown in a phase also from the XC SOAR program. And, and Bob built this really awesome professional flight test report on SX-1, which again, a lot of this is going to be in the, in the article that he publishes. This is uh, some of the summarized flight data of the subsonics at particular dates, and even makes his own notes uh, in how long he flew. And probably the biggest surprise as we started these flights of the subsonics was the fuel economy. And I was quite shocked, actually. Uh, when Bob was doing these uh, hour 20, hour and a half, hour 45 minute flights and uh, coming home with, uh, with a third of a tank of gas or more. Now that's pretty awesome. And then there, there's what some of the flight summaries look like as well. But what I wanted to show you is the power of this XC source. So this is just a smartphone with a GPS antenna stuck to the, uh, the glare shield with that Velcro. And you can actually see the color indicates the ground speed. So with the color coded kind of graph, you actually have a feel for how fast uh, Bob was going in the jet. So it's a very visual way of looking at a flight and being able to process a flight. And uh, you know, he even did some loop-de-loops and some fun things around the course. And then you can also look at it if you're more of a, a technical person, you want to look at it as a barograph. So again, the color correlates to ground speed and you can see where in the flight profile again with time marching forward here. You can look at it in terms of altitude and in terms of airspeed. I think that's a very cool way to view a flight profile. And then uh, the, this is actually another series, flight number two, trace altitude and climb uh, barrow. But you can see this is a, a series of flights and um, really, really fun. Really fun to analyze stuff. And he even has some, some mile per hour averages that he can go in and graphically uh, depict. So that's one option is this XC sword. This is the one I've come, become uh, quite a fan of, and that's a Cloud Ahoy app. And this is actually referred to me from one of our builders, uh, one of our customers who came to workshop and said I use it for all my flying. This is just a sampling of uh, some of the flights that I've logged. And you can see, you can look at the time, what airplane I'm flying. And uh, I love the, the variety here. So you can see I'm flying a little bit of everything at any given time and the air times, which are also very interesting. So uh, longest flight on here is what, 43 minutes? And uh, otherwise I'm doing half hour increments as I try to work it through my day. Um, but again, I'm doing this fairly sporadically, so this is not representative of all the flying I'm doing, but a good visual for how this could become your flight log. And it lives online, it automatically uploads when you record. Basically hit the record button and you hit the stop button. And it does the rest. And you're able down here to do some really cool things. So I've highlighted, and it's actually the one that's gray on your screen, but my longest flight on here is a 43-minute flight in the 1X number 1 on May 1st. And I came down here and looked at where I departed from. Shockingly, I departed from Oshkosh and I landed at Oshkosh. But if you're doing a cross-country, this is fun to look at. I was in the air for 0.7 hours and on the ground for 0.23 hours. Um, and then it has a debrief button, an export to KML, that's the Google Earth we talked about. You can share it, so I could go on my profile and flight share so anybody can see it. And I can also go through and delete flights that I don't want uh, reported. And then uh, the flight details, this is just that same screen previously just blown up, so we can go through it a little more. Um, and you can see it from home. But uh, the debrief is fun, you can actually go and fly your flight again through a Google Earth profile and it's, it's really a trip and sometimes it goes off track like uh, I didn't fly there but uh, it does anyway but uh, very accurate from what I've been able to do with it and here is the, the display screen so if we were to double click on the flight 
that's listed here and go to a, uh, a debrief. This is the menu that would be displayed for that flight. Same data is up here in the upper left. And down here you can do some uh, flight profile exports, which we'll go through here in a minute. And then you can also look at the various flight segments. Uh, uh, and basically it, it, it divides it up by heading and by airspeed. Kind of neat. So that's what the profile looks like from Cloud Ahoy. This is what the GPS export of that exact same flight looked like uh, from the MGL instrument. There's Cloud Ahoy. There's the MGL instrument. So the accuracy to me in a visual way is extremely good with the smartphone uh, Velcroed to the glare shield. And then this is some of the exporting. So I've just blown it up. And uh, this is the same, I like it, because it's a very visual way of looking at flight data from a GPS on your phone, which uh, has, has been surprisingly accurate as a second source of data, if nothing else. We can look at the same flight profile. Here's altitude here. So here I climbed up, and I flew some circuits, and I did a descent, and I did a lower powered run. Then I came down, and I did a bunch of touch and goes. Boop, boop, boop. And the vertical speed. Obviously, with this export, it's pretty clear to me that uh, uh, the vertical speed isn't the most accurate thing. Because I was doing some extended um, um, straight and level flights. But I was, in fact, climbing, and then I was descending. You know, or climbing here, then I leveled off, then I descended, then I leveled off or climbed a little bit, then I did touch and goes. So these are the touch and goes in, in vertical speed from all the way up to how effective are the Sonics flaps? Well, I was doing uh, climb rates, yeah, right, 2,500 or 2,500 feet per minute. That was like a low approach with a aggressive climb out. But down here, that's how aggressive the the Sonics flaps can be in some of these touch and goes. I get 2,000 momentary at least feet per minute in descents. There's a true airspeed profile, so again, looking at, this is in knots, by the way, so you have to take this 150 line and multiply by uh, 1.15 to get the, uh, the actual um, miles per hour. That'd be 172 mile an hour line up here. And you can see I touched it, but I wasn't uh, going that fast in a sustained fashion. So down here at about that published 155, what I was doing. Uh, the ground speed profile, another fun thing you can do with your airplane uh, under the uh, 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 ground speed over time. And uh, I was hauling some butt over ground speed. And again, this is again in knots, so you got to multiply it. And here's uh, what the Google Earth uh, export looks like again from Cloud Ahoy. Cloud Ahoy has some settings, so you can actually set uh, to color code uh, based on speed. And uh, the blue would be kind of slow because I'm doing a climb out there. And then I level off and I accelerate so the yellow is a little faster. And then you can see the blue here, a nice slow approaching turn to final. And then you see the red right here just before I landed on 3.6. Uh, so that's saying uh, you can actually set up what you want to turn colors. It's kind of neat. Another very common point of confusion, true airspeed. I think if I could pick one thing where I find people are confused the most or even seasoned pilots is on true airspeed. And well, it's always good to review some of this stuff. But I think uh, it's, it's ground speed corrected for wind. That's the easiest way to describe it. But indicated is what you read off the airspeed indicator. And as I said before, uh, responsible performance reporting would be taking an average, a body of work, and analyzing it properly to take out uh, as many of the variables as you can and report it as, as a true number. A calibrated airspeed would be corrected for instrument error. That's the testing we showed earlier in a couple of those slides. Being able to uh, calibrate your instruments is very important, but there's still other errors that pilots know about. Equivalent airspeed would be corrected for the compressibility of air. Rarely in the experimental world do we care about an equivalent airspeed. I've, I never use the term. Uh, I generally use the term indicated airspeed for what I see from my pitot-static system, and I use the true airspeed term uh, to look at the airspeed corrected with the moving air. So that's why I like to do those big triangular uh, uh, flights. And most of the time, again, this is reiterating it, we care about indicated airspeed. True airspeed is good, and I also like uh, GPS speed or, or ground uh, uh, speed. I refer to it usually as GPS speed. But 
Anyway, I think it's very important to spend some time understanding this. If you're going to do uh, flight reporting in a responsible way, you really need to understand the terms first. I always like to review when I do presentations like the sport pilot rules. Uh, I think it's it's fairly well known now that the sport pilot is split into aircraft and split into pilot. So when we talk about the aircraft, we're talking about uh, the airplanes that would fit into the performance box. When we're talking about the pilot, it would be the pilot that's able to fly those aircraft, whatever they are. And it doesn't really matter when we look at that performance box where the aircraft came from. They can be ELSA transitioning ultralights. The sun has really set on those, and Tim Bogenhagen knows as much as anyone about those. We have the SLSA newly manufactured airplanes, which are still being produced and sold. We have the standard category aircraft like Cessna, Skycatcher, Cessna, I guess that would be an SLSA, so I guess I'd be talking about Cessna 150, Piper Cub. ELSA manufactured kit built and experimental amateur built. 100% of Sonics are in the EAB category, but they still fit in the performance box, so you can still fly them as a sport pilot. It is most commonly, and I just put this up here about flight training, because obviously if you're not a pilot and you're tuning in, please become a pilot. Encourage other people to become pilots. It's so critical to what we do and being successful. Uh, and, and I do believe uh, truly that the sport pilot will continue to be popular, especially with our younger and our older generations. But the most common point of confusion is the performance box. People ask us all the time, can that 120 horsepower Jabiru powered Sonics be flown by a sport pilot? The answer is yes. 135 mile an hour max speed in level flight at sea level at max continuous power. The definition is max continuous power of a 3300 Jabiru uh, is, is 2850 RPM which uh, provides in those conditions at sea level with responsible data recording and reporting uh, with the standard propellers of 135 mile an hour. And actually I think it gives you up to 138 miles an hour. I just uh, wrote that before I got on. Uh, so we've got it with a few miles an hour to spare. If anybody gives you any trouble about this, please, please send them to me, FAA or otherwise. Uh, the three basic categories of uh, engines for the Sonics, this is a review of our weight slide. And it, and it all circles back to performance and kind of the big Sonics picture. We kind of have the VW-based 80 horsepower uh, engines, and that's where the Aero V squarely is in that seven to $8,000 range. We have the higher power, higher weight, bit more money, and more required by the builder. That would be like the Corvair the Viking engine, the Turbo Aero V, they're going to be like 10 to 15,000, but they might be 100 horsepower or a little more. Ready to install and run would be the third category. They're higher power with similar weight. They're going to take you up in the performance range. They're going to make you faster. They're going to give you better climb rates. We can debate all day about what an acceptable level of performance is, but I feel our airplanes do pretty well on 80 horsepower, as we've seen in these slides. Uh, but uh, they're going to cost you more money. Twenty to twenty-five thousand bucks for some of these uh, these engines. Aircraft pilots, Sonics pilots, uh, please record and share your flight data. Uh, we think it's very important that you do things like calibrate your airspeed, use that average data technique I showed you, where you're looking at a heading and you're taking at least ten or twenty data points, ten or twenty seconds. You note areas where you, you may have deviated from the factory standards. So it's very important if you are going to data report, say, oh, I don't have wheel pants on. Or, oh, I'm flying with a very coarse propeller, which is why I'm not turning up as high as what the factory reports. Uh, working with our friends at the Sonics Foundation, and we're going to pick up this conversation after this webinar about ways that we can get your data published in kind of a consistent manner and, and get more people looking at it and more people helping you. And that's what it's about, uh, having you achieve the same level of performance that we do. And we're expanding the drop-down menu for completed airplanes to include specific engines. So we're expanding our knowledge base and our attempt at gathering data to include those of you out there that are flying Sonics with Rotax engines, with uh, with um, uh, Corvair engines with Viking engines you name it we're interested in your data we want real-world data reporting and we want to know how you're doing and we believe we all win 
when we have established that way of reporting. So stay tuned. We'll announce that on the website when you're able to go to your account and log in and actually get specific on your engines. And uh, we heard from your sponsor, Aircraft Spruce, tonight, one of them, EAA. We also wanted, of course, to take the opportunity to, 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 to talk about the other sponsor, Sonics Aircraft. This is what a kit looks like. For those of you that aren't familiar, it looks like you took an airplane and dumped it in an acid bath and it fell apart on the floor. 13.5 for everything in the picture. And uh, we've even done things in this past year where we've added more pilot holes and matched holes than ever. And I always want to make sure, just like our flight data reporting we're responsible in, we want uh, you to be and other manufacturers to be responsible about what's included and what's not. So most manufacturers don't include things like motor mount uh, uh, cowling and spinner uh, in it, and uh, that's 1500 bucks of that 13.5. So very important to note that when you're comparing uh, apples to apples, hopefully. And there's the Aero V 2.1, also sold as a kit. Uh, a great success with this engine, again, creating a standard. We've taken that core uh, engine and uh, made it what I believe is a very reliable package and, and fully supported and professional and uh, has a lot of new technology, taking advantage of that big experimental on the side. And there's the, uh, the total cost worksheet. So if you're looking for bottom line, I always encourage you to do your homework before you buy an airplane. And uh, I feel this is where we really lead the industry in terms of value delivered for the, for the total package, spinner to tailwheel. Come to a workshop, please. We do two-day workshops here, here at uh, Sonics. The next schedule is in March, June, and October. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss a lot of the things you've heard in this webinar in great detail and uh, are committed to, to having those workshops for the foreseeable future. And even better, if you want to get a real feel for a Sonics, come fly it. Come actual fly one with our new T-Flight program. Uh, the, the newest note here is this paragraph since May of this year. So just a few months, we've flown over 90 hours of instruction to more than 50 students. Extremely proud of that. Uh, our students have been overwhelmingly positive about it. And in more than one case, uh, I think probably a half dozen or more uh, uh, students flying in an Aero V-powered airplane have said, OK, Joe, when when can I when can I fly an Aero V powered one? And he said, "This is an Aero V powered one, and it, it feels really good." Uh, so ju come judge it for yourself. And that's just always a, a plug for our staff, our hardworking, dedicated staff here at Science. We're very proud of every one of them. Useful links. I wanted to talk about these for a little bit. Uh, obviously, we have our Sonics links at the top, our Sonics website, a very comprehensive site. Um, and constantly being added to MGL, our friends and partners at MGL uh, that that uh, have provided uh, some of the instrumentation for us in the past, and we've been a dealer for MGL Avionics, another great site, a great source of info. The XC Soar is xcsoar.org. I'm really impressed with what these guys have done, and Bob Carlton is the one who showed us the way on XC Soar. I've used it personally as well as the Cloud Ahoy app. I highly recommend the Cloud Ahoy app. It's very simple to install. It's very intuitive. And as you can see from my slides, it's actually uh, very accurate as well and, and inexpensive. So this is quite a telling slide. <laughs> More instruments with data logging are emerging all the time. Uh, you're going to have to really try these days to find a, a, a digital instrument with a, with a color screen that doesn't have some kind of data recording capability. And uh, this is uh, from our friends at Aircraft Spruce. I just did a, a page dump uh, in looking at, uh, at uh, digital instruments. Um, and you can see there's, there's all kinds of them. I actually am familiar with most of these. Uh, Dynan, excellent company. Uh, the Garmin has the new G3X. These are the experimental version of uh, Garmin at a much more affordable price. Uh, still fairly expensive, but still uh, a lot of the same features as their certified fleet for a lot less money. Uh, the MGL series are all peppered through here. Um, the Dyn uh, again, Dyn Vertical Power, very impressed with them, uh, with what they've been able to do with some of their products. And uh, we love competition, so we're always looking for uh, more people to get in the game uh, and uh, and help provide some competition for features. It's a fun way to shop, you know, especially once you settle on your Sonics, um, to, to go uh, uh, shop for something that's straight for you. 
This is a, not a very bold prediction. I think it's actually an obvious one. But a prediction for the very near future of avionics of mine is that uh, we're going to have a thing similar to an RDAC, which is what MGL supplies with most of their instruments. This is an early version of an RDAC. They now have a much larger one with more probes and plugins and things. But this is what you're going to have on your firewall with short runs for your CHT, EGT probes, fuel level probe, all that stuff. It's going to plug in here with a wire. And there's going to be a wireless transceiver here, a wireless antenna that will transmit uh, to any uh, flat screen. This is a Sonics instrument panel here, shown. Uh, this isn't this iPad isn't quite to scale, but uh, you got 33 inches wide by about just uh, uh, six and a half inches high uh, to be able to stick an iPad on there, or your smartphone, or Android device, or tablet. I saw a lot of Sonics pilots with tablets in their in their instruments at the at the uh, grassroots gatherings this year, and uh, that's what's going to happen. This thing's going to receive by by Bluetooth or whatever other technology the data. You're going to be able to display whatever thing you care about the most in whatever way, analog or digital or otherwise, and uh, that's going to be our panel. And here's our contact info. I'll leave that up for a little bit, and. Uh, I'm very happy to take any questions that you have. I appreciate your time tonight. Okay, great presentation, uh, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, we did get some questions come in as you were talking, so let's uh, let's jump right into them here. Uh, question from uh, from uh, a number of people about uh, Dynon, and and just wondering. Um, uh, Tom says uh, that Wix recently sent him an email, uh, advertisement for a Dynon D1 pocket panel for 1200 bucks. He, he thought that was a pretty good deal. And just wondering if you had any experience with that instrument. Um, I don't have a lot of personal experience with the Dynon. I have played with uh, that D1 portable panel. So the one you are actually asking about, I have had some personal experience with. And uh, uh, an actual uh, a Sonics builder uh, actually works for uh, Dynan, and uh, we have enjoyed, I've enjoyed getting to know um, the other uh, Dynan management and ownership uh, through our AKEA, our uh, Kit Industry Association, had some great conversations with them. Um, and I think they make a heck of a nice product, I really do. I I've been really focusing our energies, or I shouldn't say it's not just Jeremy, but it's... Uh, Sonics's energies into what we consider to be the the most bang for the buck or the lowest cost. And right now, I believe this uh, uh, this MGL Extreme represents the most bang for the buck for something you can just plug in your panel and be done with. But uh, absolutely, I think everything I've heard from builders who've used Dynan products have been positive. Um, Again, I'm a big competition guy, so I want them all to be successful. And I want you, most importantly, I want you, the builders and the customers out there flying, to have the panel that feels right, that is right for you. Great. Uh, follow up here from Bob. He's just wondering if uh, Dynon also has the SD card like the MGL does. In my, I, I believe they do. And if they don't have the SD card, they definitely have, uh, you heard me mention it, on some of the uh, MGL series that they do offer an, an output cord uh, or an output device so it will either transmit like we already talked about or you can actually plug it into a laptop or other recording device but I, I have to defer that to Dynan and uh, but I'm, I'm fairly certain that they do have SD card technology some of their stuff Great. Bob asks, uh, do you have any procedures for any structural recording such as accelerometer or strain or load? Mm -hmm. uh, the sky is the limit there, man. Uh, that'd be pretty exciting. Um, right now, I haven't, and, you know, and, I, and I am a mechanical engineer, so I absolutely am familiar with the devices you're talking about where we could, we could actually mount a strain gauge or a stress gauge right on the skin, the wing skin. We could put it on critical structures like the wing spar uh, to know exactly what it's doing, to know that you're uh, in, a, in a safe mode. You could even put an alarm on it. Uh, I mean, I really haven't put much thought to this, to be honest, but I'm intrigued by your idea, and I understand where you're going, that uh, we could have kind of a, a structural alarm, if you will, 
that uh, we could in the near future build into these structures. What's what we really like about metal, uh, other than the fact that it's inexpensive and and works as its own tool and and, it, and is very clean to work with, and and, and uh, it doesn't care about what temperature it is. A lot of reasons to work in metal, but another exciting one to me would be uh, you you could stick a strain gauge or something on it and and have it. Uh, consistently read and not be impacted a lot by things like temperature and, and flight loads. So that'd be kind of cool. That would be very cool. Uh, Dudley wonders, would it be reasonable to do comparison testing over time at a constant density altitude such as 2,500 foot density altitude? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I'd encourage you. It's a very, very excellent question, Dudley. It's exactly what I was talking about. So we do want to be very cognizant. I didn't, I glossed over it in my presentation, but we have to always consider climate conditions. So right now today, as Tim can attest, it's, it's cold in Oshkosh. It's cold. It's like winter already. We've had it for like five days, right, Tim? Um, yeah, you got it. <laughs> it. It needs to go away, but um, it, it has been very chilly. The climb performance of our airplanes uh, in this weather is phenomenal. Phenomenal. And that's, I think, part of what I always thought as a kid. I think that's why uh, ski planes are so popular because the performance you get in climb with ski planes is a lot better because of the, the colder air. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, on the flip side, the colder air is denser, so you don't go as fast. It was always price. But, it, but uh, there was a, the, a Robbie Culver and I had a brief email conversation. He's with the Sonics Foundation as well. And we talked about, wouldn't it be cool to do like a, a national recording, data recording day, where you have uh, people in, in different areas of the country that have consistent weather. And uh, then we're talking closer to apples to apples. And I think that's exactly where Dudley was headed. Neat. Uh, Lionel just has a, a comment here. He says, Omega Engineering has many strain gauge slash data logging products. Cool. Yeah, Omega now we just... Omega Engineering. <clears throat> All right, great. And now we just need uh, something that will work with maybe my future concept of a Bluetooth device that would accept a number of different um, inputs. So, you know, lots of opportunities, as, as we've all discovered with our smartphones. Uh, you can geek out anywhere, anytime now. So uh, let's geek out. Let's build some data. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm almost bordering on being overwhelmed by data right now. Given that we have these 10 flying aircraft from an electric aircraft to a jet aircraft to our, our current fleet, which always needs to be flown, and I always want more opportunities to analyze, uh, but we're doing the best we can and uh, trying not to, not to let it control us. You know, that's one of the things that intrigues me most is that, okay, we're getting this overwhelming mass quantity of data, like you just said, but how do we make it to our advantage? How can we cause it to eventually save us time and give us the information we're looking for more accurately and easily? I predict a data backlash, which I think we're already in the midst of with certain people, but uh, I'm no nihilist, please. But I definitely am someone that's always looking for the practical, for the answer. And uh, how does this enhance my life and how does this uh, uh, increase our uh, our knowledge base. Yeah. Rick is wondering, do you have any stats regarding countersunk rivets versus standard? That's a great question and one we field uh, a lot. Um, the answer is no. Um, and the reason is I really don't have two identical aircraft, uh, one being uh, uh, protruding head riveted and one being countersunk riveted. I would say uh, the Xenos is all countersunk riveted or factory Xenos. I'm kind of cruising up to it here. Um, that is a fully countersunk dimpled airplane, but it's also the slowest one in the fleet, so it can't really race with the Sonics. What I would do if we were, <coughs> excuse me, if we were to put that to bed for good, uh, we would probably build a 1X that would be fully flushed and an identical sister to uh, to one of our other 1Xs and, and go fly it. But I would actually uh, submit that you may be quite surprised as to which airplane is actually faster because those uh, protruding head rivets after the spar could act like uh, a bunch of dimples on a golf ball lowering 
lowering the profile. Something we've speculated for years, but uh, haven't gone out and tested. Cool. Rick uh, asks uh, if you have any comments on the vertical power. It sure cleaned up the panel with no breakers. Cost, weight are similar to standard breaker system. Mm -hmm. I have it on my YX with a dual screen, full Dynon D700 screen. Very happy with the system, no flight time yet. Great. You know, I think uh, as far as we've started to distance ourselves as a company from making specific electrical recommendations. And it's not because we, we, we don't want to help you guys. But if you look at these panels and go back and review the webinar uh, as I reviewed them, you're going to see they're, they're about as simple electrically as anything. Um, we have dip switches. In some cases, we don't even have breakers. Um, and in this case of the 1X, I have an automotive uh, uh, circuit breaker box, which is plug-in automotive breakers. You know, we've gone very, very simple in our electrical panels. Oh, but we also have one of the most advanced electric aircraft in the world. <laughs> it's a bit of an interesting uh, contrast. But uh, it makes us, it's also very difficult, obviously, as a company, an airframe and an engine company, to keep up with the latest digital electronics. Um, they stand at odds sometimes. But uh, that's great. I have heard the same things about some of these packages. Um, and I'm not saying we won't enter that market for kind of an all-in-one solution for the electrical side. But at this point, we're letting you guys figure it out and, and, and use what, what, what is best for you. All right, Eric's wondering if you've taken a look into the uh, i-level wireless AHARS unit uh, that will provide info to tablets. I have not yet, but I think that's exactly where we're heading. <laughs> I think that's where your question was leading, is that that technology may already be here in at yeah. least some form. But, you know, okay. Tim, you and I were at Sun and Fun this year and uh, obviously able to watch Air, walk Air Venture Grounds and the buildings. I was just blown away at how many new digital instrument packages there were. Just blown away. I mean, at Sun and Fun alone, I probably saw eight new packages that I had never seen before. It's happening quick. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, isn't that cool? And another well, interesting note, the, the FAA, uh, you know, I, fully, I feel certain people in the FAA want to see this technology advance in our experimental aircraft so we can be proving grounds uh, and show uh, through safety of flight and through number of hours that these are very good solutions for the rest of the fleet, the GA fleet. Cool, cool. Rick just makes a comment. He says, I wish you had a T-Flight program out west. I am almost complete <laughs> with my YX and would love it for testing. Uh, love the updated disc brakes. Uh, I have the canopy and cowling to go with and Great. it's the only part of the build uh, I don't like. Great. Well, well, I got to tell you, until they invent clear aluminum, we're stuck with plexiglass. That's my tagline. Um, and, you know, plex, if you treat it well and with respect, we've had really good luck here at the factory, but we have a lot of experience. Take your time. You'll be fine. On the T-Flight program, oh, yeah, we would love to have a, a on-the-road, if you will, T-Flight program. Uh, we've actually discussed this seriously with certain members of the Sonics Foundation, I bring that up again, and some of the other hosts of these uh, uh, grassroots events. Uh, the the LOTA process is relatively new in terms of getting traction with manufacturers, and that's the letter of deviation authority that you need to be able to provide that kind of for hire training, and that's really what pays for the program here at Sonics. Uh, we wouldn't be able to offer it without charging something. Um, but the bottom line is right now, come to Oshkosh. Come on out. We'd love to have you. We would love to show you what we have here at the factory. Uh, we'd love to have you to take the opportunity to fly. And it may seem like uh, quite a bit of money to jump on an airline and come to Wisconsin. But uh, it, hopefully it's going to be in summertime. And hopefully it'll be uh, a worthwhile experience uh, contributing to your lower insurance bill and, and your overall safety. And of course, we got EAA here on the other side of the airport. So uh, when oh. you're here, you can visit the uh, museum here. And uh, if you're an EAA member, you got free admission. Great plug, Tim. And uh, it is a world class museum, as you all know. I get lost in that place, and I live here. There you go. Um, 
And uh, we're always updating and changing. That's one thing I like about uh, our museum is we seem to, to be able to, to change around the displays every now and then to bring different aircraft in and, and get them in different positions. It's gorgeous. Okay, so Dane is kind of wondering, uh, on the Sonex specs, I'm surprised the difference of airspeed is not that much different between 80 horse AeroV and 120 horse Jabiru. Why, why is that? Price difference I'm between the two engines is significant. <laughs> I'm extremely pleased you brought that up because it's a very important point that I flat out missed. Um, we have what's called, so first off, let's, let's cover these numbers, uh, the, the Sonics ones you're talking about. In the 120 Jabru, when we publish this 135 miles per hour at sea level, it has everything to do with sport pilot compliance. It is all about max speed uh, at sea level, at max, uh, excuse me, cruise speed, at max continuous power at sea level. Doesn't mean the thing you can't advance the throttle beyond uh, the 2850 RPM and go faster. You can go 150 miles an hour at sea level. Uh, you can, uh, But it's important that that be published that way because that's how sport pilot rules are interpreted. The 130 cruise at sea level with the Jabiru and the and the uh, uh, 80 horsepower Aerov, we publish a higher uh, uh, continuous RPM. So that's why we close that gap. So where you really, <coughs> excuse me, open it up is at altitude. When you get to 8,000 feet and you're able to open up the Jab, you get to 170 miles an hour versus 150 for an 80 horsepower uh, airplane. That's 20 miles an hour. That may be what you were commenting on with your question, that, man, that 20 miles an hour, that's just not very much for 50% more horsepower. That is accurate. And that comes from what we call the drag bucket. It means that for every mile an hour faster you go, it takes more and more horsepower to push through the air to get through going faster. And uh, trust me, plenty of race cars deal with the same thing. In IndyCar, we've about reached the limits for what they can do with horsepower at those speeds. And they, they could push the horsepower even further, and you would not see a huge jump in speed. It would be a, it's kind of a, a falling off the cliff kind of uh, graph. But we experienced that, and uh, there's some people running around there with some very high-horsepowered airplanes that aren't going very fast. That's true. Okay, Ryan's got a question here, kind of following up on performance. He said on the 11.6 YXT flight, um, let's see, you made a comment that said it was heavy, so I assume 1,100 pound max gross. Uh, Jeremy showed numbers that indicated an average climb foot per minute of 423 foot per minute, and a graph showing the variation in climb foot per minute mins and max and, and nothing in the graph approached the published numbers of 1100 pound max gross utility category YX of 800 to 1000 foot per minute with an aero V. Where did yep. the 800 to 1000 foot per minute come from and is this still valid? Yeah, I, I believe that uh, through this process this is a very heavy uh, YX. So this is the T flight uh, that was discussed uh, on our e-groups uh, last week. But um, in my opinion, the 800 to 1,000 is probably a little high. Uh, I think that uh, a four to 500 feet per minute is what I have typically seen, and we should revisit those numbers. That's my opinion. But uh, uh, I, I, if any of you have flown a, a Cessna 150, uh, which in reality, as you as you all may know, you have to fly a Cessna 150 over gross in order to get two uh, average sized people in it. Uh, the performance just isn't that good. And uh, we've considered this uh, 400 to 500 feet per minute to be our, our uh, kind of uh, um, lowest acceptable performance before we look at more power. But that's, that's astute and I appreciate you picking that up and that's something we should revisit. Pete's wondering, is there a measurable difference in cruise speed between conventional and tri-gear Sonics airframes with the Aero V engines? I'm sorry, what was the question again, Tim? Is there a measurable difference in cruise speed between conventional gear and tri-gear Sonics airframes with the Aero Absolutely. V engines? And thank you again for bringing that up, because that's another uh, 
point that I, you know, I could give probably 10 webinars just on performance of the various airplanes. On average, a tricycle gear aircraft um, loses about four to five miles an hour in cruise speed because of that nose wheel hanging out there. As clean as we try to make it, so for those of you installing a tricycle gear uh, on a Sonics, try to get the wheel pant as low as you can to lower that profile and try to uh, get this gear fairing as clean as you can. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's significantly more draggy. So that's where that four to five miles an hour, and that's where some of the published numbers for the, uh, the tricycle gear aircraft come from. Uh, what, what we've published is tail dragger aircraft, and you can, um, you can expect about that four to five miles an hour, and obviously less climb performance as well. Cool. Well, we're about uh, the end of our uh, our time here. There's there's a number of comments uh, uh, congratulating you on a great job, and uh, Rick makes one specific here, and uh, he he wants you to uh, please tell everyone how great you and Carrie are with tech support. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, I just want to make a, a statement to all of you that are still with us. Um, what drives all of us here at Sonics on a daily basis is is your enthusiasm, your successes, and your positive energy. And and it is very true, no matter what kind of business you run, and, and I know a lot of you are probably sitting at your computers shaking your head as I make this point, um, no matter what business you run, you always kind of deal with some difficult people. And, and uh, I tell you what, they tend to be sometimes the loudest and the ones you remember at the end of the day. And we work really hard to focus on people like you, Rick, that make those positive comments. And we try to focus on the successes and the many uh, hundreds and thousands of successes we've heard. Uh, and, and we deeply appreciate it. Uh, you know, those accolades mean a great deal, not just to me, but obviously to the entire crew here at Sonics. Well, that's awesome, Jeremy. Uh, you know, from behalf of EAA, we, we thank you for coming on board tonight and sharing your information, giving us some ideas about using modern ways to collect data to verify performance and appreciate your transparency with, with your factory aircraft there and laying the numbers out for us uh, that, you, that you have with those. And, um, you know, that's uh, really good information to build on. And uh, well, like you said, with the way the technology is going, it, it's only going to become more uh, of this and uh, so we well, need to learn how to use it for a practical a practical benefit to us all. You bet. Thank you Tim. It's my pleasure and same right back at you for supporting and I know this role you've taken on in kind of running the webinars I feel it's a very critically important role to EAA and again I encourage any of you out there take this opportunity as you have your webinar feedback form to shoot some comments to Tim and I about what other things you'd like us to talk about. Uh, we're very interested in 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 uh, in rolling out webinars and other uh, other info that you are interested in hearing and and any gaps that are out there. Uh, we're all ears and we're interested in your feedback and that's true of our company in general. So keep those comments coming. Absolutely, yes. Please send in your comments and feedback to us here at EAA. Give us some some ideas about what you'd like to see in the future. You. You drive it. Uh, attendees uh, checking in, uh, you're the one driving what we're providing here, so tell us what you want. Uh, appreciate that, uh, that thought, And Jeremy. I also wanted to say, Tim, I was over at headquarters yesterday as part of that uh, aircraft industry kit owners, uh, kit industry association, my father, Van Grumzen. Uh, we're, we're really our uh, friendly competitors and we got together and had a really positive meeting with the leadership of EAA yesterday and really talking about home building and doing whatever we can to support EAA's efforts in home building, which is also obviously your department, Tim. And uh, we're going to be here for the long haul and uh, want to invite you to make any, any suggestions to us as well on how we can help you. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that, sir. And uh, with that, uh, let's, uh, let's end it for the night. Uh, for all the attendees, thank you so much for, for tuning in tonight. Uh,